In this roundup of the week, following the vice president's debate, we asked what we learned from the two candidates who are actually able to speak in complete sentences. We ask whether President Trump is really as recovered and healthy as he says he is, and Britain and Europe prepare for yet more lockdowns, in spite of the growing chorus of criticism. My name is Alan Baker. This is from Alan Baker's show for Changemakers. Welcome back to the battle of ideas that is 2020. I hope you're well. This week saw the debate between the vice presidential candidates Mike Pence and Kamala Harris. The mainstream media headlines have been that it was a much more respectful debate than last week's and that a fly landed on Mike Pence's head. Which, to be honest, I didn't even notice. Let's see if we can do a bit better than the media headlines. Watching this debate, the thing that struck me the most was that the reason why these debates go badly wrong is that the format is terrible. Let me explain. The purpose of the debate should be, should be that the candidates get to put forward their best pitch for whatever it is, why they offer the American people is what you should vote for. In addition, of course, they should be asked for their defence on the harder questions, and they should be able to challenge and counter-challenge each other. If both sides get to do that, we come away feeling as though we know a little bit more than we did before, even if we learned it by sort of reading between the lines. The format for these debates actively works against that, and it's a result of the fact that it tries to cram in too many questions. As a consequence, it gives too little time to each question, two minutes, And the host initiates each new topic by asking the candidate a question that specifically is crafted around their defensive area for hard questions they don't really want to answer. Now, any smart candidate is going to know that they need to lead on their strongest pitch, not simply go in playing defence. So they have to ignore the exact question and make that pitch regardless. That is the logic of the position. And the two minutes isn't even long enough for that, so they're being cut off before they're even finished. It looks like they're just avoiding the question. In this case, they both candidates did it, and they were both right to do it, because the debate was trying to force a format onto them that operated against their interests. To calmly, respectfully do what you need to do anyway is the most effective thing to do if you're in that situation as a politician. A better format would be one that just focuses on three or four of the big, most important questions. Give each candidate a longer time, say five minutes, to reply to a question that basically invites them to lay out their strongest case. I'd add a rule that says this opening segment should be about what they will do if elected, not attacks on the other side. Then follow up with the question that focuses on their defensive area. They've had their chance to make the strong pitch. They should now be able to show how effective their defence is to answer the hard questions. Then invite each other to respond to what the other has said and let them make their jabs and counter jabs at each other. Now, you could argue that putting candidates into a stressfully crap format is part of a challenge. See how well they deal with it. And on that basis, both candidates in this case dealt with it kind of fine. But it meant that the quality of the discussion was much less useful and much more frustrating to the audience. I wasn't a fan of Mike Pence's habit, for instance, of answering the previous question rather than the one he'd just been asked, which he did repeatedly. I don't think that came across well. How would you describe our our fundamental relationship with China? Competitors, adversaries, enemies? You have two minutes. Thank you, Susan. Well, let me, before I leave that, let me, let me speak to voting records if I can. But it was fine. It was a consequence of the format. So, all right, that being said, what's the headline for the outcome? If this had been the presidential debate, not the VP debate, with these two candidates, Pence would have won it on this showing, I believe. Of course, if they'd been speaking for themselves, it would have been a different debate. So whether he would have won it or not in that situation isn't at all clear. Since this was the vice presidential debate, and so the objectives were slightly different, it was pretty much a draw. Both candidates scored hits, no knockout blows. Very hard for there to be a knockout blow in the VP debate. 
Both of them gave solid enough performances that you wouldn't think it was the end of the Republic if one of them ended up having to step in prematurely if their boss became unable to carry out their duties as president. Which is good, because that may well happen. Harris scored shots on the question of the pandemic, as you would expect, simply by pointing to the number of deaths and identifying it as one of the highest death tolls of any country. Now, you could have answered that charge, but Pence didn't. He blunted it slightly by observing that the Biden-Harris plan is not that different to the Trump-Pence plan. But these things come down to the questions of competence in execution and particularly on consistency and accuracy in communication. That's where the Trump ticket is vulnerable. He didn't defend against that. Harris didn't particularly attack on that. Probably a missed opportunity from both of them. But the pandemic is Trump's worst issue. And simply pointing at the number of dead and saying, his fault, it's probably all Kamala Harris needed to do. And that's what she did. Pence scored shots on the argument that Biden would raise taxes and challenging Harris to answer the question as to whether they would pack the Supreme Court and then highlighting her refusal to do that. Those were the high points. As for the low points, well, Harris on the Trump is racist tack made blatantly false statements about how he hadn't condemned white supremacy, which, as we've shown here before, he repeatedly has. And then Pence on climate change. He said, we will follow the science. But he was using the phrase to avoid saying anything about where he thought the science should take us. I mean, look, I don't care what your opinion is about climate change, let's have the damn discussion. Make your case strongly. Don't code it in weasel words, presumably because you're afraid that your position might lose you a few votes. People have the right to know what they're voting for, whether it's stacking the court or climate change. People shouldn't be allowed to dodge these issues. And that brings me back to my opening points on this. The debate format was about pitting two people against each other to see if one could deliver a knockout blow. It wasn't designed to inform people on what they would be voting for. I don't blame the candidates for that, but it's not satisfactory. Now, you might say, but they have their whole campaign where they can make their case for what they would do. But that's not what they do with their campaigns. Not unless... It turns out that is actually the best way to win. Right now, the main basis, for instance, of the Biden campaign is to point at Trump. That's it. How would you describe our fundamental relationship with China? Are we competitors, adversaries, enemies? You'll have two minutes uninterrupted. Susan, the Trump administration's perspective and approach to China has resulted in the loss of American lives. American jobs, and America's standing. There's a weird obsession that President Trump has had with getting rid of whatever accomplishment was achieved by President Obama and Vice President Biden. For example, they created within the White House an office that basically was responsible for monitoring pandemics. They got away, they, they got rid of it. And it's very effective. It's likely to get them elected. But elected to do what, exactly? It's a pretty important question, right? These debates could be the device whereby candidates have to set out their stall. But currently they're not. After this, there was a tussle over the second presidential debate, with Trump saying he wouldn't take part because it was proposed it would be virtual. Can't say that I especially see the logic where a candidate who's behind in the polls to a candidate who has had little scrutiny to date refuses a debate. From a campaign perspective, it's the opposite of what you'd expect to be successful. That's all now been amended to postpone the debate for a week so that it can actually be held face to face. If it goes ahead, the question will be whether Trump, who swears that he won the first debate, can actually persuade the audience of that. The polls say that Biden got a boost after the first debate and that was increased when Trump was announced with COVID-19 to the degree where Biden was reported to be 16 points ahead. How accurate are those polls likely to be? In terms of the exact numbers, probably not strictly accurate. Marcus Roberts of the polling organisation YouGov said that when there's a week with really bad publicity for one candidate, yes, 
Some people will be swayed in how they intend to vote against that candidate. But you will often also get people who do intend to vote for the controversial candidate who will go quiet. They become less likely to talk to pollsters about their voting intention. That said, there is additional evidence that Republican campaign teams on the ground are seeing unprecedented negative polling from certain demographics that normally perform pretty well for them, particularly seniors. There may be uncertainty about just how deep a hole the Trump campaign is in, but it seems pretty incontrovertible that it's in a hole. Logically, there is an extremely limited number of things that could conceivably turn that around. None of them have much to do with what President Trump does. Trump is the incumbent. Everyone has pretty much made up their mind about his strengths and his weaknesses. At this stage, it could only really come from new revelations about the other side. People could stare long and hard at what's on that side of the table and suddenly ask themselves, what is it that we're actually getting for the next four years? Because it's the question they've not been asking. If Biden gets a bad moment, a really bad moment, not just a fumble, and people conclude that, say, his mental decline is really much more severe than they'd realised. Or if there's a moment of radical honesty, a policy proposal comes to light that is misjudged in some dramatic way. Or, well, look, you get the general idea. The Hillary Clinton email investigation switched the momentum in 2016, soon after everyone thought that Trump had been sunk by the Access Hollywood tape. Arguably, it would take something like that to make the difference now. And I wouldn't count it out, because there's no doubt a bunch of people will be out there looking to make it happen. If there's anything out there, if it exists, they are working hard to expose it. The other joker in the pack comes down to Trump's health, because I'm figuring that there's at least a 50-50 chance, probably greater, but at least 50-50, that COVID-19 isn't finished with him yet. The problem he's created for himself is that he's telling the story of his miraculous recovery. And this shows how strong and how full of vitality he is. Other people, lesser people, get laid up for a couple of weeks with the virus, or even sadly they die. But President Trump is a superhero, next to a god really, and he can just bounce back in fantastic shape just a few days later. Someone who had the apparent problems that he did so early on in the appearance of symptoms and someone who the medics thought needed dexamethasone. That suggests he had a bad case or the medics used a much more serious drug than others would have prescribed for a mild case. There are many people who have reported symptoms easing before getting a lot worse in the second week. That doesn't mean he won't get better, the vast majority do. But they don't just suddenly emerge looking heroic and full of energy. They crawl out looking like they've been pummeled. The thing is, he's now created a public front, getting back into prime health. Don't be afraid, he said to the predictable outrage from the media. If he now gets worse, he will want to cover that up. Every bit as much as the media will be desperate to sniff it out because to be seen to get worse will undermine his position as Mr. Robust in the face of a virus. He's been feeling great, he said. But we know that such feelings of euphoria are common side effects of the dexamethasone that he has been taking. He was already detected covering up coughing in a telephone interview. On, I think, the first debate, <coughs> they... Yeah, Excuse I'm, me, I'm, on the first debate, they oscillated the mic. And it's not the fact that he coughed that's particularly interesting. A normal victim of COVID, even one that was on the mend, might well be expected to cough. It's the fact that he tried to cover it up. It confirms the impression already created by his evasive doctors that covering up is part of the election campaign. If he pretends, and it turns out to be a lot worse, and he gets found out, that's pretty much the end of his campaign. If irresponsibility in the face of a virus is one of the top campaign issues that's bringing you down, then that outcome would be just like finding the sore spot and whacking it repeatedly with a mallet. Now, maybe Trump is genuinely restored to perfect well-being. 
maybe the novel treatment the doctors tried on him, is simply that fantastic. He lucked out, getting sick at just the moment when he could benefit by the experimental work before it had become normalised. Maybe. And I mean, I hope so. Both for his sake and for the possible treatment that will then be made available to others that need it. But in the absence of new information to the contrary, I default to believing that the universe is still the same as it was the last time I looked. Either he wasn't that sick to begin with, and I can't see the rationale for faking it, or he was that sick, and there's a good chance that it's not over yet. If that's the case, he needs not to hide it. Full stop. Now, at the time of recording this, his doctors have been saying encouraging things. Maybe between shooting the video and uploading it, the announcement will come he's now testing negative, or some other announcement. This is a crazy helter-skelter ride we're on. It's all happening rather fast. But it feels helter-skelter out of control to me, not dramatic last-minute return to form. And now we have Nancy Pelosi, the Democrat Speaker of the House, saying that she wants to talk about invoking the 25th Amendment, whereby a president who's not in control of his faculties can be removed from office. Today she announced a congressional commission to explore Trump's fitness. You might ask why she would bother doing that, because even if the amendment were invoked, and there's no chance of that, by the way, but even if it were, the process would take about the same length of time to run its course as is left between now and the election, which, you know, she expects to win. The only thing that occurs to me, and I haven't read this anywhere, and no doubt I'm wrong, but the thing that occurs to me is... Now, this might be a mechanism to force disclosure on the president's health, with the assumption being that it would expose a cover-up and damage him even further in the election. We'll soon find out. This video is fated to age quickly on this point, quite possibly even before you watch it. And every day that passes with the president in a stable condition makes it more likely that a better outcome results. Since he said that he wants to do rallies this weekend even, right now he obviously feels pretty stable. If he's not, the rallies will get cancelled. There's nowhere to hide. So that's the US. According to news reports, we have people dropping like flies in the face of COVID-19 in the UK and Europe. And that means, yep, even stricter lockdown measures are coming. That second wave, they kept saying we were in already over the last couple of months. Well, now they're sure that we're in it. And if you look at the graph of cases, it looks a lot worse even than it was the first time around. But of course, we've discussed this often and we already know that the second spike in that graph has resulted only in this tiny spike of deaths. So whatever it is, and we've discussed that, it's not the same as what was happening in the spring. The open question is how bad it does get now that we're approaching winter, when respiratory deaths normally hit their peak. Having pretended we had a second wave already through the summer, when almost nobody was dying, people are now showing signs of, frankly, exhaustion as they face the predicted prospect of six months of additional winter lockdown. The government's scientific advisers have called for urgent and drastic action after recorded cases doubled in 11 days to 14,542 and deaths doubled to 76 in the same period. Rates in Manchester have doubled in a week to over 500 cases per 100,000 people, with other northern areas close behind. And this is the rationale for the approach the government has been taking so far, which is to go for local lockdowns rather than national ones, hitting the areas that have the most cases. The only problem is that it doesn't seem to be working. In Prime Minister's questions, the opposition leader, Keir Starmer, put it to Boris Johnson that 19 out of 20 places that have local restrictions have seen recorded cases surging in spite of those restrictions. So the pain doesn't seem to be bringing the promised benefits. For the government's advisers, the answer to lockdowns not working is, yep, you guessed it, more stringent lockdowns. Prominent member of the SAGE advisory group, Professor John Edmonds, said that since local measures had failed, 
we need to take more stringent measures, not just in the north of England, we need to do it countrywide and bring the epidemic back under control. In Scotland, the First Minister has been leaping ahead of the curve, declaring war against the previously unrealised primary transmission vector for the virus, namely alcohol. With daily admission levels just one-tenth of their peak in April, Nevertheless, Nicola Sturgeon has shut down all pubs and licensed restaurants for two-thirds of the population, with a ban of serving alcohol for the rest of the population, where they can serve food and soft drinks, but only until 6pm. Hotel restaurants can go beyond 6pm, so long as there's no alcohol. It seems that the second any of these Scots get a whiff of alcohol, they just lose all discipline and start, you know, cavorting. How uncivilised. But it's not just Scotland. Bars and cafes in Brussels were closed for a month this week. Four more cities in France are joining Paris and Marseille. Berlin is imposing curfews on its bars. New York has begun imposing new lockdowns in some areas, largely in Jewish areas where they've been getting somewhat restive in the face of restrictions. And back in the UK, according to the BBC, just 3% of hospital beds nationwide are currently occupied by COVID patients. Daily hospital admissions are rising, although still a very long way from the previous peak. The majority of those are in the north of the country, as we've seen. But to say the numbers are increasing is one thing. The question is whether the increases are even exceptional. Because, as the BBC also admitted, hospitals always get busier at this time of year. Is this really going to be following a normal seasonal curve, which we would, you know, generally ignore? Or is it the start of an upward spiral that will soon be out of control? We still don't know. What we do know, however, is the massive economic damage we're currently inflicting on ourselves. My sense is that we're entering a critical phase in one sense, which is that we're being set up for a crisis and a meltdown. The government is utterly convinced it needs to take the strictest action on COVID-19 or else all the figures will go badly and we'll have even worse deaths than we did the first time around. The trouble is that the government is becoming widely seen not to be competent. Constantly changing rules, shambolic implementation of track and trace measures. It's now constantly in the headlines. The selection of which areas get locked down and which don't is increasingly being seen, not least by the people in those areas, as not consistent and not fair. And particularly since the differences seem to reinforce a pre-existing north-south divide. After half a year of measures, every additional restriction now is going to be piling on the pain as businesses of all sizes that were hanging on by a thread finally get pushed into bankruptcy and the jobs will get lost. And the contrary voices, the scientists and their amplifiers who oppose the logic of the lockdown approach, are becoming more widely heard as certain mainstream media outlets begin to take up their cause. The most recent expression of this was the so-called Great Barrington Declaration. Thousands of people, including some respected health experts, issued a statement saying that the approach being taken to COVID-19 is having a devastating impact on physical and mental health as well as society more broadly. They call for protection to be provided for most vulnerable to the virus while the rest of society gets on with their lives. As immunity then builds in that wider population, so the dangers to the vulnerable will become less. Now in the UK, those arguments have been brushed aside. The BBC quoted Dr Stephen Griffin saying this, While clearly well-intentioned, the declaration has profound ethical, logistical and scientific flaws. And he went on to list two objections. One, that the vulnerable come from all walks of life and deserve to be treated equally. And two, that so-called long Covid is reported to have left some of those non-vulnerable people with problems such as fatigue and joint pain for months. Now, I'm open to the best arguments from both sides. This is a difficult area. But those don't seem to be particularly strong arguments for measures that inflict massive damage on society. Does our desire that vulnerable people should be treated equally mean that we think it proportionate that hundreds of thousands of people should lose their jobs? 
if people may catch an ailment that unfortunately gives them fatigue and joint pain, that's a bad thing. Is it something you should shut society down for? I mean, there have been such ailments throughout human history and we didn't do that before. Did we decide to change that policy? Do we think that people who are vulnerable to cancer, who aren't getting screened, or indeed aren't getting treatment, do we think that they are being treated equally if we're focusing on COVID-19 to the exclusion of all else? I mean, that is the debate we should be having. Now, other objections to the declaration were more practically focused. They argued that it's easy to say that the vulnerable should be protected while everyone else gets on with life, but in practice, not obvious how that would actually work. After all, even with lockdowns, many vulnerable people were still affected in the first wave. OK, some of it was that people were sent into old people's homes and we know not to do that again. But even so, many vulnerable people were affected. If everyone was running around catching and spreading the infection, then that would be much harder to prevent. So really, it is the equivalent of saying, let them die. That's a stronger argument. Although you have to wonder if the same energy had been put into solely protecting the vulnerable rather than all the government efforts spread thinly across the massive project of shutting society down, then maybe it would be feasible. Not everybody thought this was a discussion we should even be having. One member of the government's SAGE advisory group, Stephen Reicher, tweeted this. How to undermine a scientific consensus that gets in the way of profits. One, get a few individuals to take an outrageous position rejected by all scientific organisations. Two, boost them through a media obsessed with controversy. Three, claim scientists are divided. And four, ignore science. And with that last point, he linked to another professor's tweet. We said this, scientists aren't divided. There are maybe max four or five scientists pushing let the young get it in the media. On the other side are the CMO, CSO, NHS, BMA, WHO, ECDC, CDC and pretty much any public health expert you care to name. I think that's a bad argument. It conflates the science of epidemiology with the public policy choices around what to do about how society works during a pandemic. The details of the virus, who suffers from its effects the most, how it spreads and how much it spreads, in other words, the science of it all, those details are not under dispute. What we should do about it, how we should balance the harm to individuals from COVID-19 against the harm to individuals from non-COVID-19 diseases and the harm to individuals from the destruction of livelihoods and the harm to mental health from the impacts of lockdown. That is the legitimate and urgent question that people want to and should be discussing. The answer to that question may be to do exactly what the orthodoxy suggests. But to argue that it is so straightforward, we shouldn't even be having the discussion, that is, well, let's just say it's not an argument that's likely to carry the day, given where we are. Now, that said, it is at least an argument. Others don't bother with such old-fashioned things. They just resort to ad hominem attacks. The left-wing Guardian newspaper seems to be gearing up for one of those right now. Dr Martin Koldorf, one of the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, got this email shared on Unheard. Hello, Dr Koldorf. I'm a journalist at the Guardian newspaper and I'm getting in touch because we are intending to publish an article about your appearance on the Richie Allen show on 6 October. The article will state that Dr Martin Koldorf, a co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration, appeared on an internet radio show which has previously hosted multiple anti-Semites and Holocaust deniers as well as other conspiracy theorists. The article will also look at Facebook data around the Barrington Declaration and mention that the declaration has been shared approvingly by a number of lockdown sceptical politicians. Who'd have thought it? Anti-vaccination Facebook pages and conspiracy theorists. And that really is the worst of journalism right there. You appeared on a show and other people appeared on the show. So what? What's more, 
your content was shared by bad people. But just because a bunch of people think that such argument shouldn't be discussed or spread online, it won't really matter as these things unfold over the coming months. Because, like it or not, they will be discussed. Right now, the majority of the population still supports lockdown measures. But the numbers that don't are becoming more numerous, more mainstream and more angry. Do we really think we're all just going to bunker down for the winter months and everyone's going to comply and it will all be fine by the end? Movies that start like this don't end like that. All right. Last week's episode was once again demonetized soon after going live and then restored on appeal. This happens every week now, so I have to believe it's just kind of flagged to do that because this channel tends to deal with risky topics. It's just one reason why I'm hugely grateful to the good people that support this channel via patreon.com forward slash Baker. You enable me to produce the content that is most interesting without worrying about whether YouTube advertisers will appreciate it. I'm planning on evolving these videos in the next couple of weeks, which should mean more content on a regular and predictable schedule. That is only conceivable because of those patrons. So if you would like to join the people who already support the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to provide on this channel, please go to patreon.com forward slash Baker. Either way, have a great week. My name is Baker. This is The Baker Show. Mm-hmm.